Um, hello everyone, my name is Ria. I am Head of Marketing for uh, SMOOF, which is a digital agency based here in Innovation Birmingham. We've got an office just over there. Uh, we do websites and applications uh, for sorts of really interesting companies. So if you're looking for anything like that, just come talk to me afterwards. Uh, I want to talk today about how to create content that actually converts. So, for the sake of this, the word conversion refers to um, translating your visitors into customers. If you've got an e-commerce site, that's obviously going to be when they buy something. Um, but if you're sort of in a more B2B sector um, or you're offering services, that's going to be when they take the next step and actually contact you either via phone or via contact form or email. So the problem is, um, and I'm not sure if you've seen this yourself, but you get a lot of sites these days that favor jargon over clarity. Um, I visit websites all the time and it takes me a lot of time to actually work out what that company does. And this is especially true with B2B companies. People think that using ridiculous buzzwords is going to get them more sales than they're actually being clear with their messaging. So the result of that is you're alienating your customers because you're not explaining what you do and they're going to go to your competitors and you're going to lose sales. So what you need to do is present a solution to their problem. When you search for something on Google um, or when you're looking for a company in general, it's because you've got a problem. That problem might be that your kitchen's flooded or that you want to buy a new pair of boots. So you're looking for a solution to that problem, so a plumber that can get you quickly or you know, someone that sells really nice boots. So you can start by actually working on your messaging. Um, how many of you have actually got your own companies here? And how many of you honestly would say you spent good time on market research? Very honestly. <laughs> um, what you really need to do is start with opening, identify who your target market are, and talk to them. Find out what they're actually looking for, and then match your messaging to their needs. <coughs> By finding out what their problem is and presenting a solution to it, you're a lot more likely to actually get them to turn into customers when they actually visit your site. So it's a really good idea to actually work on your messaging, um, create like a bunch of assets that address this, so snappy taglines, um, uh, press release, that kind of thing. So you've got these assets ready to go. Everyone in your team is on the same page when it comes to that. You can also give your customers superpowers. So this is going to be things like how you can actually really, really help them. For example, if they're looking to increase their sales, which obviously everyone is, say, we're going to increase your sales by 400%. Obviously, it has to be based on fact. You have to be able to back this up. But you kind of have to think about your product or service being spinach, your customer being Popeye, and then you're giving them the strength they need. So if you create random like guidelines and assets, it means everyone's you know, seen from the same team sheet, essentially. So you can actually catch people before they hit your site. Um, a lot of traffic to websites comes through search engines. Um, in case you're not familiar with search, or uh, well, SEO really, um, you have your meta title, which is in blue there, and then your meta description. And these are actually elements you can control on your own site. Um, you can actually make sure these things here are selling before people hit your site. So customize your meta title and your description. Make sure you're getting the solution to their problem in at this early stage. And that way, when they're in their search results, they're going to be like, oh, well, that addresses my need. I'll click through to their website. So here's a couple of examples. This is a completely major lead company <laughs> uh, from Shiny Happy People. Would you read the job uh, visit the job the site at the top? Or would you go to the second one where they're clearly stating what they do and how they can actually help you? How many people would visit the first one? Not most of you. And how many the second? Yeah, yeah I would. Too. So once they've actually gone through that hurdle and they've landed on your site, here you can really use your website to sell to them. People don't use websites in the same way they read books. They're not looking for rooms and rooms of text. They're looking for instant solutions to the problem. People um, will want to see headlines so you can easily find out what this company does and again, how they can actually help you solve the problem. So make sure your core message is displayed prominently through you know, H1s, H2s, um, and get their attention as soon as they land on the site. Don't make them visit your about page to actually find out what you do because you probably lose them as a customer and you have to do that. Avoid the huge paragraphs. 
and talk about your product in terms of how it's actually going to benefit them rather than what you do. So don't just say, we do this, we do that. Say, we can help you do this, we can help you do that. That's what they're going to be interested in, and that's what's going to make them want to take the next step and contact you. Speak their language as well. Make sure you know who your customers are and what they're actually going to want to hear from you. Um, you know, if you're in a B2C uh, business, you might want to sort of use a language that everyone's going to understand, whereas certain B2B companies or service industry companies, you can speak a bit more technically and use, use language like that. You can increase trust using testimonials and case studies. That's going to help if your company is completely new to them. They, if they see that other people like your product and have you know, spent, their money, spent their money with you before, that's going to give them confidence. You can use calls to action to actually guide them through the site and make sure you're navigating them through the funnel um, the way you want to. And you can also use A to B testing in order to refine your message. So there are really great services out there like Optimize the NVWO. Um, you just have to put a little bit of code on your site and then you can create different landing pages, use different messaging, um, and very, very easily find out what's actually resonating with your customers. <coughs> so here are a couple of websites that I've just marked up. Again, you've got the Jardim Field one, and you've got an example of something that's actually more likely to convert by listing benefits to you rather than just talking in buzzwords. Course to action, you can, um, again, lead them through the site by saying, we're going to increase your ROI, we're going to help you attract more customers. And then you can very easily say, visit our services page, find out more information, or don't really get in touch with us now. <coughs> so why does this happen? Why are we seeing all these websites that are just full of jargon? Um, can we just do a little test here? So again, if you've got your own business, put your hands up. And keep your hands up if that business has a website. That's good, it should, it should do. Um, Put your hand down if you built that website yourself. So, Stuart, why did you not build your website yourself? I specialise in what I do, and I don't build websites. So exactly. I'm too specialist. And I think that's probably the story across the board. People don't build their own websites because they don't have that skill set. But a lot of people think, hey, I can write, so I can create content. And that's not necessarily the case. I'm sure some of you are fantastic writers. So web content is actually quite a tricky thing. You've got to take relatively short, short amounts of space and fill it with something that's going to increase your sales, get customers to convert. I believe that content isn't as important as design and development when you're building websites. So I think if you need to hire a professional, do it. You need to invest in that because that's what's going to get you sales at the end of the day. If you've got a beautifully designed website but it's full of text that doesn't make sense, people aren't going to shop for you. So I just want to end on this note, don't make content an afterthought because if you invest in good content, your website will become your best salesman by a country mile and that's the most valuable thing at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Ria at all? What's um, that to you guys? Really good things uh, um, I've got one question. We work with clients and we do write some content, um, but the real challenge is get the visuals right to fit the content and get visuals that are not only correct for that piece of content but consistently over the website. So, have you any tips for uh, creating or buying a library of visuals to fit your content? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so there are a few services out there. One that I came across um, a website actually called Sopley, and they create um, brand assets like that. Um, you can work with a designer specifically in order to produce those. There's also like a load of uh, sort of things you can use to kind of make sure things are on target at an early stage. Like the mock-ups I did there using Balsamic, um, they're great for making sure text fits. In general, it's a kind of, you know, working with the other person process. Like when we're building websites, um, I'll work very closely with our designer um, and we'll kind of go back and forth and back and forth and I'll be like, I want more text and he'll be like, I want pretty things. So <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, having a bit of a flexible approach really because um, one party tends to have to give a little bit more than want to. But 
a lot of it comes down to making sure that you know the message that you're going for, you know what your brand is trying to say, um, because if you do that, then everything you write kind of should go with that tone and with that voice and, and have that message. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? One more question? Yeah. Oh. Oh, two. Sorry. I'll just have <laughs> Thank you for the talk, I mean, it's very uh, beneficial. Um, my question is, you mentioned content. Um, how do you know you're creating content that people are actually looking for and searching for online? Okay. Because I think there's a danger of uh, creating content which no one actually um, finds online. So how do we um, make sure that the content that we're creating can be seen? So um, that comes down to what I was saying about making sure you're researching your market. Um, you can use a bunch of different tools like Google AdWords have got a really good keyword planner so even if you're not going to do AdWords um, you can actually search um, by keyword terms uh, to see what's actually getting search volume and what's not. And this is why people should always do that because they might think people are, are, are interested in their service and their message but they might actually be interested in something slightly different. So using that Google Trends is also really good for that um, and also talking to your customers. Go out there and say you're my target customer, what do you actually want from us as a business? And it might be you've been kind of going this way and they've been wanting this. So it's just about sort of making sure your brand is actually aligned with your customer's needs. And talking to people is always a great way of doing that. Um, just a great thing to do is take your website, show it to a bunch of people, preferably who, who <coughs> want to be your customers, and just say, what do you think of this? What is the message you're getting from this? How can we make this better? And they'll probably do a bit of a job for you then. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one more, if you want to. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you said something um, earlier in your talk about the, the nature of the content that an, a com company should, um, should talk about what benefits they give to the customer rather than what they actually do. And I'm not sure I, I agree with that 100% because quite often I find myself looking on a website at a company and I want to know what do you do and they keep telling me what benefits they can give me but I'm not interested in that, I want to know what do they do. Yeah. So it is a bit of a balancing act. So what I kind of tend to advise people is um, if you've got a, if you visit a website and you get that initial banner which is kind of standard nowadays, you tend to have a big thing of text and then a, like a subtitle beneath it. So what we do on our website is we say, you know, we make websites and then we say, you know, we'll increase your, your, your leads and your customers and that kind of thing. So you're very clearly stating what you do, which can be difficult, especially in like quite niche areas, to sort of distill that into a few key words. But customers tend to make their mind up in the space of a very short amount of time, like seconds, as soon as they visit a website, if they're going to stay on that or not. And if they're not, they're just going to leave it. So you want to make sure they know, as soon as, you, as, soon as they get there, what you're actually doing in a very broad sense and then how you can benefit them because that's going to be what encourages them to read on. So it is a bit of a, a balancing act. But you can use things like Google Analytics to see how quickly people are leaving your site and that and uh, like testing, A-B testing as well so you can, you can play with the messages and actually see which one's doing better and just keep testing and keep iterating and, until you find the message that's definitely resonating and definitely working. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I think speaker card. Does anyone want to do a one minute pitch and put their hands up now before um anyone? No? Okay then have a think about it because we can do it again when I we um transfer to the, the, the next speaker. So if I can introduce Karen now. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Clive. I'm Commercial Director with Breaking Free Group. Um, what I'm going to do is talk you through a little bit about why we do what we do, then what the hell do we do, uh, where we're going to go for the next few years, and then probably most of the, the quick talk will focus on what we've, what we've learned along the way. Um, so why, why am I asked to talk tonight? Um, very simply, at this point, as of Monday, we celebrated five years of trading, 
I'm not very conscious. I've never put my hand up and said, right, let's talk about what we do. So I thought tonight would be a, would be a good night for that. Because I think any it's rare for technicians, B, it's pretty rare for health technicians, and it's impossibly rare when one director's a Man U fan and the other is a passionate Liverpool fan. I'll leave you to guess which, but I think they really can't play football. Um, so, why do we do it? Jonathan Thane, the other director of business, is a clinical psychologist. Um, He's not a tech guy, but he basically saw a market gap five years ago, or longer than five years, actually, it was forming his mind before that. He felt there was no reason why it couldn't be done, and basically he said, why not? So he had the risk, he sort of appetite, he said, why not create something new? So what is it we do? Um, we are a psychology services business. We hire technology, and we focus on a pretty big niche, which is addictive behaviours. Blood and focus on alcohol and drug addiction. And we've built a traditional healthcare platform that targets the underlying psychological and lifestyle factors behind addiction. Big words. I've spent all my time trying to think of better ways to describe what we do. The trouble is, is that some areas of the market we address is very academic. Some is healthcare, and healthcare guys tend to like big words, I've found. Um, but I spend most of my time as sort of more of the market commercial side trying to think of shorter ways of doing this. But bottom line is, we, we have products that service the alcohol and drug addiction markets. And they're actually fascinating. I knew nothing about this a couple of years ago when I got involved. Um, my particular addiction is coffee. Um, and I recognise addictive behaviours, I recognise cravings, I guess everybody in the room probably does. But now I've learned a lot more about these two markets. They're both fascinating, but commercially what's fascinating is they're big, they're global, they're not going away overnight. And it's actually a fascinating market being involved in something that both has social purpose and also is doing something with technology in an interesting and new way. John Tiggle and Money Rainbows from a uh, business that some of you know of, uh, Mid Venture, which is a Midlands based investor, who've been brilliant for us. Um, and we've got 2.5 years on where, well, we do turn over. Uh, we do turn over money, and we've just moved into profitability. We're at a really interesting point in terms of moving forward. Uh, the team have developed a clinically robust treatment program uh, through systematic, systematic intervention mapping. It's back to, well, what, what is it we do? Well, that is, we've had 12 publications published academically that say this thing works, which is my main scepticism coming into the business. What is this? And what it actually is, is a new product in an existing market. So right now, if you're an addict of any kind, you've probably speaking got three options. You treat yourself, i.e. you stop smoking, you stop drinking, you stop self-emission. It's quite hard. Certainly with coffee in my case, I can't stop right now. Michelle, I don't lie. It's very hard to get me away from the coffee bar. Um, the second option is there's something called rehab, and that's generally expensive. Does it work? It does work, but it's hard. And also lots of people relapse. You'll see in the press lots of public examples of people relapsing, relapsing. Recovery journey is a, is a lifetime commitment in most cases. And the third option is through uh, our main customer base right now, which are in this country treatment uh, rehabilitation services, the likes of CRI, turning board deductions, mostly charitable sector, uh, mostly through the public health budget. Um, fantastic people, generally um, volunteers working together with addicts. Um, what it isn't, which is where I came into the business, thinking, well, you go to a GP, you talk to a GP, and a GP refers you. We don't sell to GPs, um, we don't sell direct to consumers. Our model is we work with partners to sell to others. Um, therefore, our partners typically are giving out or vending our products free of charge to their end customer. So a drug, drug addict uh, will access our program free of charge, but purchased as part of the treatment pathway by one of the people we sell to. that makes sense? Well, if you want to feel more, start to win more, um, we tend to win lots of things around innovation because this, we think, is genuinely a new product to the existing market. Um, it's quite hard work, though. Developing anything new is bloody hard work. Um, currently, we've got two products. This is one of the a graphic. Um, we've been commissioned by 16 uh, local authorities and NHS trusts, uh, three of the largest four national service providers. Uh, so right now in Birmingham, if you go through one of those two addiction pathways, you will work with our product base. Um, we're, we're in Birmingham right now. We've just uh, received accreditation by OCR, which basically means anybody going through the programme and completing will receive an educational certificate in life and living skills. Um, a lot of the people going through our programmes, that's a major self-esteem moment uh, without getting too carried away with it. A lot of people are looking for um, validation that they're doing something worthwhile. They're treating their own addiction. They're going through something worthwhile. And right now, you can get an accredited certificate through our program, which we're very, very proud of. It took a lot of work to get there. 
Um, but it actually means a lot when you see people coming through our program. Uh, and again, it also involves a new product. It, it only comes made by its treatment. Addiction is one of those things that very few people admit to. Um, often people who are most in need, it's obvious for everybody else but them. Um, 24 hour accessibility, if you think through the existing service pathways. People who are counsellors will go home at 5 o'clock on a Friday, whatever on a Friday. Um, we open what's about in terms of stigma, uh, whether that's um, time reasons, people working reasons, there's lots of different things that our program adjusts to. It's not very good, it's not very clear, but it's quite interesting looking at the evidence um, in terms of how we're overcoming some of the barriers to treatment right now. We think it offers a new service opportunity. Conscious of time. Um, part two, this is the very first. Uh, we worked with the Ministry of Justice over two years, and that's bloody hard work, uh, working over two years on a new quiet. Um, to develop a, a new um, health intervention for prisons. We're currently <coughs> in 10 prisons in England. Um, commissioned by NHS England, and the key thing here is it provides continuity of care. Prisoners will only get a drug addiction uh, treatment within prison, delivered by a counsellor. The moment they get released, um, put through by a prison service rather than their own uh, release, um, they will lose that counselling service. Now, what our program allows them to do is simply lock back in once they've got to the outside world and continue their treatment pathway. And where normally get very excited, this does provide continuity of care. So there's an opportunity. We're offending is a major issue in this country and around the world. Uh, we're excited about that opportunity in terms of tackling part of that issue. We have got a we have an app alongside us, it's an app-based business, but it's um, it's an interesting adjunct to what we do. Um, there's a lot of data, I'm quite happy to answer questions on that, but let's move on to what we're doing. Over the next few years, three to five years uh, right now, so, um, we're growing, we are currently hiring, um, we're building out our team, particularly in tech and marketing here, and research in our Manchester office. If you'd like to have a chat, I'm happy to talk afterwards about some of the things we've got in mind. We're developing new products and refining existing ones. We've got a lot to learn in the products we've already built, but um, it's, uh, it's an interesting time in that respect. And we are starting to look overseas. Uh, thanks to Michelle and the team, we were in Dublin last week. There's certainly an interest over there. Um, and there are other countries around the world where these are issues. Um, so it should be interesting our journey over the next few years. So uh, what I asked to speak to, uh, tonight, I thought I'd just give a few lessons. This is not meant in a patronising arrogance or the way it's more a case of we've learned a few things on the way. Um, these are some of the things we've learned in our particular journey. First things first, uh, our team has changed since day one. Uh, it's the team that's making the business work right now rather than an individual. So if you look at our five key sort of senior team members right now, um, you're all very sorry, I am the boy in accountant who does all the financial and commercial stuff. Um, John R. Fanger is product guy, he was the guy with the idea, he's the psychologist, he knows how to build down good products. We've got a technical officer who looks after our technology platform and the way we develop our tech. We've got a head of research who is a fantastic ac uh, academic, she has more qualifications than pretty much anybody else I know of, but she, she works with the academic institutions as improving our product base. And then our fifth guy, our sales guy, he is a criminologist, he knows the sales sector well. In other words, between us, we really are not from the same background, um, but in our own specialisms, we hope we know enough. Uh, we're also quite good at challenging each other, and probably most importantly, we're also good at backing up that we know we don't know the answer, but he does, or she does. Uh, and that's important. Here in the board meetings don't resemble the nights of the pub. I sat in the boards in the past. Um, if you've got a board meeting where you can have it in the coffee house or the pub, you want on the right board. Uh, it's not to say board meetings should be always argumentative, but board meetings are to make decisions, they're not to chat things through. Uh, and that's one of the key things we've learned to do. Every board meeting is a challenge, not about that, yeah. just in the challenge where do we go from here. Secondly, our team has been built by trying to find the best people. The best people aren't always immediately available. Uh, and we've built our team through thinking creatively about how to be higher. Um, it doesn't have to be full time. Um, it doesn't have to be intern only. I've worked with a number of the teams in this building and people tend to be polarised on, it must even be intern because it's cheap. We're a full-time guy because I need to build a team. Actually, the best use hybrid skills, uh, freelance skills. There's a lot of very interesting techniques around. Um, I think part-time portfolio works is a great way to get experience and skills. Uh, it's just a case of where do you need in your business right now. Thirdly, um, People procrastinate, in my experience, in startups. They worry too much about achieving the perfect vision. Right now, there's lots of things that need to solve in our business, as to the rest of the team. But we're trying to get on with making the best of the decisions we've made thus far. 
rather than making the best decision. Um, I think you've just got to get on with it. The bottom line is every day goes up or down. It's actually more important to stay fairly tranquil about it and just get on with stuff. Uh, and then deal with everything that comes along the way. Um, fourth out of five, don't chase grants. We could have got very easily carried away. I think we have at times got carried away at chasing grants because that paid the bill tomorrow. Um, grants are great if you can get them for the right purpose. But I've also encountered a number of competitors, in, particularly digital healthcare. There are lots of startups in digital healthcare. Just sales. Uh, I came from an investing background, and investors are mostly impressed if you can sell. And if you can generate cash by selling, then actually often you either don't need investment or investors, there's too many investors, um, because they look at the fact that you can sell. And ultimately, you grow a business typically, uh, and take occasionally can be different, but broadly the same dynamics work. Um, you've got to be able to sell. And they say either if you can't sell, get somebody who can sell. So a lot easier to get investment that way. You tend to be on your terms, not theirs. Um, and that's always good because the aim is to end up hopefully with more rather than less. Uh, if you're in a private business, obviously it works differently across different sectors. And then lastly, I suppose I would say this given I came from that profession, but investors are not all rocket scientists. Some of you will know that by now. But they also don't expect you to be either. The key thing for me is, is that they're not there to always give you a hard time. They are just focused on their particular rationale, which is to make a return on what they put into your business, just like you are typically. And your investment return might be in money terms, it might be in value terms, it might be your own self-esteem. But actually, investors mostly are broadly in it for the same reasons you are, but just from a different slant. Unless you are make stuff up. Now, unfortunately, hand on heart, we haven't done that. Um, but we have had some rocky moments along the way. You will do with any form of outside investor. Um, the key thing is, is to understand what their motivation is, what they're trying to do, and work with them rather than against them. So, um, a long way around of saying, we're thrilled to be here, thrilled to be five years. Uh, we have a little office over there, and if anybody would like to come and talk to us at any point tonight or beyond, I'd be delighted to, to talk to people. Hopefully that was interesting. Thank you very much. Any questions for Simon? Uh, hi there. Um, you're obviously doing stuff that's new in the space, uh, but you're also getting great success in getting the commissioning bodies to take you up. How are you approaching the commissioning bodies and getting the products in there? So, first thing to ask, it's taken five years and it's still a work in progress. Um, commissioning in healthcare is difficult. Um, we are getting better at failing fast, namely trying to, it goes back to the targeting positioning point, um, it's understanding why our product is required in that economy as opposed to targeting the whole thing. Um, and we would realise probably a couple of years ago we were quite different parts of the healthcare economy. Um, we realised actually our product suited best here. And we've just gone at that in a more focused way in the last couple of years, which is why right now, I wouldn't say success is bringing success because we've still got a long way to go, but we're starting to see momentum. And momentum's key in these things. Um, there are other parts of healthcare economy we want to get to. Like I said, working with GPs, working with primary care is, you know, that's the bulk of the UK population goes through those treatment pathways. Uh, it's tough work. The NHS has an incredibly difficult job right now. Um, you know, cost pressure, innovation, um, expectation, a growing populace, so many issues to cope with, um, and we can't actually solve all of those things. And therefore, for us right now, um, it's just focusing on the best areas for us to grow and flourish. Are you um, getting to the point where it's almost a fr uh, you can talk in terms of a framework agreement with the NHS now? No, no, no. That's um, no, no. They, 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 I knew very little about the healthcare economy two years ago, I'd argue I probably know very little now, but um, it's it's hard work, it's very, very hard work. Um, and there are some things I would, I'm very deeply frustrated by within that framework, but ultimately, you, you know, if you're running a business, you're running concern, it's just getting your head down and getting on with it. Um, and we are focusing on where we think we're going to do the most value right now. Which is, mean, which you're is almost second. in the mental health. <laughs> Oh, well, area as well, which is under massive pressure. So it's yeah. brilliant that you're doing so well in that arena. So there is a fit in the sense that a lot of people who have mental health problems have actually um, decided, not decided actually, sorry, that's very much the wrong word. Um, the co uh, habitation, you know, if you have a mental health issue, how do you deal with it? Mm. A number of people deal with it by drink or drug. 
So actually, a, a lot of our pathway that we're trying to work out how to coexist with others mm. um, rather than replace. And therefore, we have our mission really is about widening access rather than being the main provider. Because what that means it's a normal miracle cure, it works, we know it works clinically. Um, and if we can address a very small percentage of the market, it's still a lot of people. Um, and right now, you've got that the social care budget is in a, it's limited. Uh, mental health rise is more of a pressure on mental health right now. Um, one of our key differentiators we think is the evidence base. It's one of the things that doesn't work. No. Um, and 12 papers should be 14. That's a, that's a large amount of evidence right now for anything new. And that's actually one of our key value drivers going forward is building out that resource base. So. But it's tough work to me. Yeah, right, to succeed in that <laughs> space at this point in time is stunning. So well done. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Um, one more question. Right at the back, behind you. Actually, next to one. Please, after you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, on and attendees on the forum. Um, I'm interested in uh, if you uh, to ask you if you use open data in your work uh, or publish any open data or any of your own data. Well, the work that you do in this, we're trying to encourage that in the region. Okay, um, so data input is anonymized. We don't collect any personal data. Um, therefore, we don't share any data. Not um, personal data, open data. Yeah. Sure, data. sure. But um, we don't connect with any other systems, basically. Um, we don't pull any data in from outside. What we do provide, though, is commissioners. We provide them with a dashboard showing impacts and uh, efficacy of our program <laughs> through the use of the, of the tool. Um, so in other words, a commissioner for Birmingham can see the number of people using our program at any one time, but at a modernised level, solely driven by our program. Um, one of the issues with the NHS economy is, is, is a desire, and I understand why from some angles, but a desire to put everything into connected, you know, into uh, one system. That's actually hard work, because the very data standards required are also a reason why it's very hard to move healthcare systems into the open economy. Um, we decided a couple of years ago that actually we have to concentrate on the treatment pathway rather than interconnectivity. And so right now that isn't an agenda item for us. Not I'm happy to talk about it because it, it will evolve, but as an early young business, you've got to focus on what you need to do right now. And that's where we are in five years in. So does that answer the question or be not the right way? Let's have another chat. Okay. <laughs> One more question and I'll let you this guy. So <laughs> <laughs> Hi, congratulations by the way. Thank you. Five years. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if you might paint a bit of a picture um, of your journey from idea stage to first customer and crucially what you would do differently if you had to do it again. Okay. Apart from die. <laughs> <laughs> a little hard for me because I wasn't the founder. I'm, I'm the, the guy that came in as part of that journey to move, move business on. Um, I think. What would John do differently? Well, he wouldn't recruit a Liverpool fan as his <laughs> um, which is why we never talk football. Um, I think the biggest thing is probably expecting too much too soon. Um, I think if he if he came in with a better sales thought process, um, I can't comment for him, but that's my hunch. This is a hard product to sell. It is a hard market to target. Um, but we probably weren't sharp enough with the way we described ourselves. We're not there yet, we're definitely not there yet. But actually knowing who we're targeting, we should have known that earlier than we did. Um, observation from other things I do, most people build tech and then work out how to sell it. Now, somewhere in that journey, it's got to change because every, most other things follow. You know, describing what you do and why to other people, generally people start visualizing, why would I use that? And in our case, one of our hardest challenges has been who will be selling to and why. Um, because you get, you're get not carried away. I mean, there's so many exciting things with our program, but actually the hardest thing is we try and focus people on what it is we do right now, not necessarily the object. I can see, trust me, upside in what we do going forward, um, and it is exciting that way. <coughs> but actually, back to reality, you know, I've still got people to pay, uh, customers to work with, proof to point, um, and the exciting bit at the other end is we're treating people through a a difficult um, clinical condition every day, and that's exciting in that respect. So that's probably the key thing, but of course, I'm not that awful man you found that um, I described earlier. So. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. I'll give it one more go because I saw James looking for some of the one minute pitch. Oh, are you there?
Okay. Hi, everyone. We're in Team of Five. Uh, we're building a private hire app system uh, for Birmingham, and we're targeting uh, students and young professionals uh, in this area. Now, I have to say that we all have background, you know, technical backgrounds. We're also like journalists and I handle the sales business and the overall project management. Um, now, the reason why we're doing this is because um, we want to offer a chance to the product hire markets in the area to uh, offer a better product and really uh, keep their businesses and keep their customers happy. Now, I want to thank you, Michelle, for uh, hosting this, and we have already applied to E4F, so okay. thank you for being here and hosting the, these all events. And my last thought would be that we're looking for people that are interested uh, in doing some, some things in this area, and I would love to chat with any one of you. Thank you. So, so uh, if anybody can hear me, so I'll be juggling glasses, uh, notes, and pointer, and probably glass of water at the same time. So bear with me. Uh, if you can't hear me, I will. I will uh, pick up my phone. Uh, thanks, Michelle. My name is Roy Meredith. I'm from uh, Marks in Birmingham, which looks at inward investment into the city. I focus on digital media, tech, and creative industries, as well as a few others such as BPFS. Um, I'm also part of E4F uh, here. I've just started as an advisor and mentor. Um, I've chosen the largest subject in the world, as far as I'm concerned, for, uh, to discuss your pitfalls in publishing apps and games. Um, in 10 minutes, I can't possibly do it, because my first draft was 30 slides long, and I only just managed to reduce it quite down. Um, so what I'm aiming to do is to touch on some of the most common areas that people fall into traps with when they publish, and I do stress it's publishing apps and games. I'm not here to talk about development. I've run development studios, but that will make the presentation about three days long. Um, what does somebody from Martin Birmingham know about apps and games publishing? Well, um, just to give you an idea, I've worked in... Uh, digital media, be it music, be it film, be it games, be it apps, for, well, actually for longer than some of you have been alive. So just, it's not a post, I just want to show you that I do know what I'm talking about. These are the titles I've led on an international basis. Uh, um, I say led, I mean senior commercial positions. There are also a hell of a lot of products that I've led on international basis that have died a horrible, horrible death, mm -hmm. and that would be about four slides of this build, and there are a lot of them. In fact, I'll refer to one later, and you can see why it died. Um, so I do know the pitfalls that people face within this. Um, I'm going to start going through it in a chronological order. I don't know what whether people here make apps, are planning to make apps, make games, are planning to make games. So I'll start with business plans and go forward. People generally look at two markets, and that's our friends Apple, and Google, iOS, and Android. When you start your business planning, probably most people will release on both. They will build on both. But you're going to have to focus on one key area when you're bringing it to publishing. You should publish both. You should promote both. But because of the differences between them, you do find that there are different challenges. And to get absorbed with both challenges is very, very difficult. So Apple has this really nice, clean ecosystem. It's protected. It's restricted. By comparison, Android is a really <laughs> complex beast. It's really messy. I, got, I presented this at work earlier, actually. I got really told off because I was being dismissive towards Android. I'm not. I love Android. I think it's an absolutely brilliant format. But the problem is it's really complex. And I'll show you some of the complexities of it later. And if you're doing it on other operating systems, such as Windows Phone or BlackBerry, I'd say please stop. Don't do it. Please, please stop. Unless Microsoft's given you a ton of money to do it. In which case, please do it. The problem with the other operating systems, they just don't have the commercial reliability at the moment. Um, Apple is, is huge. You need to understand, sorry, the, the motivations when you're building a business plan of these two huge companies. Apple, although they, they actually uh, create $37 billion every year from the sale of apps, in fact, one game alone generates $600,000 every day for Apple. Although they create a huge amount of money, they're only interested in one thing, and their interest is selling you hardware. That's what Apple is. It's a hardware company. The way you can best promote your app 
is by having features on it that relate to 6S, 6S Plus, and Apple TV. Because if you've got Force Touch on there, this new 3D Touch, they're more likely to promote it than ever before. Android, or Google by contrast, they're more interested in you, in me, and everybody else. They want our information, they want our habits, they want to know what we're doing every single minute of every single day. They're not interested in hardware because they don't own any hardware, everybody else makes it for them. And that's their motivation. So unless you understand those motivations, you can get drawn in two different directions with your business plan. Um, the other thing, one, one thing about Apple is there are 1.6 million apps available on their app store at the moment. That's a huge amount of apps, and it's like walking, well, probably DVD is a bit of a dead format now. Ten years ago, walking into HMV to look for a film to watch and finding out there's 1.6 million films, you're going to get lost. How do people find them? I'll come on to that a little bit later within here, but to give you an idea of the competitive field, uh, in October, 50,000 apps were submitted to Apple in one month. Uh, 14,000 of them were games. And this month, they're already going to do more of that. It's 1,800 a day in October. They're up to 1,900 a day at the moment. How on earth people cut through that and think they're going to you know, get a game onto the charts or get recommended by Apple? It's a really, really, really complex space. This is the best slide I've ever written. And you'll see why in a minute. I think it's the best slide I've ever written, I should say. <laughs> Um, uh, it's also, I think, the most important slide I've got here is the X. Now, Ria spoke about clarity of messaging. This is all about clarity of messaging. Uh, the X comes from an EA process. Um, when we were at EA, we worked on a thing called the X process. No surprise. Basically, it's the heart. It's the elevator pitch. It's exactly what your product is. It is no more than one sentence that sums up exactly what your product is. It doesn't describe all the product, it describes the heart of it. And the, the danger of not being able to do that is you are in love with your products, you're making your products, you know everything about them. And when somebody asks you about it and asks you to do an elevator pitch, unless you've got a, a sentence that sums up the heart, you'll try to tell them everything. And they will take away, in a Chinese whisper, what they heard, not what you said. And they will tell other people. And word of mouth, as we all know, is tremendously, tremendously important everybody's going to get the wrong idea of what you're doing. The reason we had, a, had an X process, we had studios making games, we had publishing, publishing, marketing, legal. Okay, Studio would tell them, would tell marketing, this is the game we're making, now go away and tell people about it. And studio started making games in this direction, and marketing heard it here. And by the time you reach market, you're miles apart. Games fail because of it. It's really important. I'm giving you a couple of examples of your from the EA days. You might have seen on the screen earlier, works on a game called uh, Medal of Honor, Allied Assault. The X for Medal of Honor, Allied Assault, was step into the boots of a World War II soldier and experience the chaos of Normandy. There's a couple of very, very key things there. Stepping into the boots of a World War II soldier is a first-person shooter. It's already told you it's a war game, but it's a first-person shooter. So you're going to see things from this perspective. Not behind the character, not a strategy game, you're doing the shooting. Experience the chaos of Normandy, taking private Ryan. That's it. And that's all it was. Every single communication that EA ran on that game reflected that, that, that one statement. And every single communication you make, be it to investors, be it to communities, be it to within advertising, must reflect that X about your product. Another one, a, a great one, one where I was, <laughs> I don't know how I can actually say this, but what, what, I worked on a game called SSX Freestyle, it's a snowboarding game. It was a second SSX game. And it was about, um, it was about snowboarding down a mountain and you had to basically <coughs> everything about the mountain and you know, kind of give the snowboarding middle finger to all the other characters on it and make your character the best. Tons and tons of X's were written. It needed to reflect snowboard culture, it needed to reflect the music in the game, it needed to reflect that you were going to achieve everything within this game. Over the Mountain was one of them and it didn't quite work. And somebody in Canada came up with the best X I've ever heard, which was make the mountain your bitch. And I just thought, <laughs> that's it, that's exactly what snowboarders are looking for. And all the marketing communications reflect it. The X is the most important thing you'll ever come up with about your product, that core heart message. And the reason it's, I think it's the best slide I've ever done is because that's all it is. That was my X. And now I talk about Google being messy. Operations, you want to do the fun stuff. When you're making an app or a game, you want, you want to do the development, you want to get really deep into it. You want to do the publishing, hell, you even want to do the distribution. What you don't want to do is operations. Conversely, compared to the last slide, I hate this slide, because I hate operations. And every single thing on this slide you have to consider. 
from prototype to QA and development and operations right the way through to this is murder. Reference builds is a nightmare. I used to I work very briefly in Java where you've had hundreds of thousands of different phones you can port it onto. And when Apple came out with iOS, we thought, great new world, wonderful. Well, there's now 40 different builds on iOS you've got to produce if you go around the whole range because people are still using iPhone 4 to play games on. And the problem with operations is all of this. This is all the stuff that really, really drags and, and really, really pulls you down and defeats you. There are ways to get around this. There are companies that will help you do this, and I, I'm happy to point people in the direction of companies. And they don't cost you. Well, they're not free, but they don't cost you. And I'll come on to that in a little while. The one thing you've got to remember is in mobile, everything changes always. I can give you, I've got some slides on here. I present, one slide I prepared six months ago has changed already, and I'll point out to you why it's changed. But one of the most important thing is this. 1,000 plus devices. It's already out of date, but that's not just devices, that's reference builds. And if you don't know, a reference build is the mother that serves a lot of other builds. It could serve Motorola and Samsung, and there's another reference build that serves Motorola and Samsung with different formats as well. It's a nightmare. And don't go asking Google for a list, uh, for a list of reference builds, because they don't have one. And don't look online, because, hey, guess what? Everything changes always, and it's out of date the moment you do it. But as I say, there are companies that can help you navigate this, enabling you to get into the fun stuff. <laughs> okay, another irritation. I'm coming across as really irritated about things at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for anybody who hasn't submitted a game, when you go to submit a game to Apple, and it'll take two and a half, three weeks to pass it if it's got no problems on it, and then they launch it, and they don't tell you that they've launched it. There's been times when I've been sitting at work, and somebody says, our game's out. You think, shit, we better stop marketing it, <laughs> because Apple haven't told us. This is where you tell them where you want it to be sold. You just tick it. And this, if I can obliterate one thing in life, they have the choice to take one button away from digital everywhere, it's that one. Select all. Because everybody does it. Hey, why shouldn't I release my game in Madagascar, the Republic of Moldova and Botswana, as well as UK, as well as the US? It's a really good reason. Because nobody will ever know about your game. You're not promoting it there. You haven't told anybody. You haven't localised it into Moldova. You haven't issued a press release into Macedonia. And you haven't taken into account not only localisation, but contrarization as well. I can't tick this box on Tomb Raider. This one here. Saudi Arabia. Because I'm not allowed to release a game in Saudi Arabia with a girl in shorts and a vest. Culturally, it's abhorrent. So we have to actually change the bill for it. And to be quite honest, there's no point anyway, because we're not going to, we wouldn't localise it into Arabic at the time either. And they only like Arabic games. But differently, localisation, India. There's a, there's a rule in India, I was told this by one of the biggest companies in India. Uh, if it isn't A, B, C, or D, it's E. And the least are for English, because it's the best language to release games in, except for A, B, C, and D. Astrology, astrology Bollywood, cricket, and deity. If they're in English, they're not interested. But if anything else is in English, it's seen as the highest quality. So, from a distribution point of view, there is absolutely no point in releasing in a territory where you haven't got exposure, where you haven't got promotion. And I'll, I'll solve this issue in a second or two. That's, that's Apple. Google, on the other hand, have this. Or Android has this. And this is just a sample of all the stores you can release your games in. Have you got time to go to all these stores and to get it, to get it lined up? This is the site that's out of date, actually, because a major Chinese company called Baidu are actually buying up a couple of other Chinese uh, companies that are on here. And the reason this is only a sample is because I've got one Russian store on here, and there's tons of them. I've got, only got Mobistar listed for Latin and South America and the Caribbean. They have 32 different stores over there, uh, digital stores over there, or app stores. I've only got one on there for India, and there are tons, because there's 700 million mobile devices in India. In fact, mobile phones are the major way of communicating broadband, isn't it? So who's going to handle this for you? Well, again, there's companies out there that will do this for no upfront cost. I've got uh, contacts I'm you know, more than happy to pass on for people who handle Japan, Latin America, and the way those people operate, so Japan is an, 
As a, <coughs> as a, um, as an example, uh, uh, an ex-colleague of mine, a very good friend of mine, a guy called Shinny, owns a company called Chorus Worldwide. I've got two minutes left, my God. Um, <laughs> he, he arranged for it to be localised into Japanese. He arranged for you to have a marketing company and a promotions company in Japan, and he'll find you a distributor in Japan, and it won't cost you a penny because they take back from the revenue. Revenue you wouldn't have anyway. So these people are all out there to help you. There's tons of them. Price. I spoke to Apple two weeks ago, uh, specifically about this, because I wanted to find out how they felt about premium and, and, and price. I spoke to the marketing manager down there. They said their official role is don't be scared to charge for games and apps. In fact, charge for games and apps because they're more likely now to promote stuff that's paid for than free to play. And they believe that devs shouldn't be scared. The big temptation is the world's gone free. And there are a lot of things to be said for free. But Android is also growing. Android, if anybody's experienced this, is a couple of years ago, you couldn't charge for anything on Android. You can now. So don't be scared to charge for games and But do get your pricing right. Um, I, I've been in research groups where I've had people debating the value of my game at 149 versus 69p, saying, I wouldn't pay 149 for that, I pay 69p, it's 80 pence. And you're using all the Mars bars I put in the middle of the table. And they cost 80 pence. <laughs> and frankly, they give you spots and make you fat. My game gives you 40 hours of enjoyment. <laughs> so don't be a child, don't be a Free, ensure you have multiple payment options for in app purchases. So in app purchases, I presume people know freemium games, give them away, get people to buy gems in the game, and it solves the time conundrum. Time is the most valuable currency in games at the moment, it's not money. Um, Multiple payment options is a game, look it up, um, because I haven't got much time left. Soccer Manager, a brilliant example of how to monetize a free game, because what they do is their save game, the same game, works on PC, iOS, Android, so Sony, um, Sony Store, and uh, <coughs> Xbox Live. So it's the same game. If you're playing on Xbox Live, you save it, you can go to your phone and continue playing the same game. And the genius is, they sell their gems across all those, but on PC as well. And as they're selling them on PC, as they're available on Apple, Apple don't mind, you can buy them from Apple. But as they're on PC, your customers are going to the PC game, they're buying your gems, they're using them in an iOS game, and guess what, you haven't given Apple their 30% share. 30% mm. share that belongs to you now. So make sure you have multiple payment options. Uh, minnows, dolphins and whales is an expression we use in Square Enix. It's gone a little bit further. Under these are super fans. Minnows are people that play a game, hardly spend anything, but actually they're your biggest audience. They're 95% of your audience. Dolphins spend 20, 30 quid on the game. Whales spend a fortune. I had a game in Soft Beta in China once. First two days, two people spent £1,800. dollars uh, $1,800 each on the game. The Chinese market is all about being best, and if you haven't got time to play the game, you buy your way to being the best of the game. And it's an extraordinary market. The problem with it was, I only had two things for sale in the game, and we were testing the price at $3. And they believed that if they kept buying this stuff, it would make them better, and it didn't. <laughs> The bad news is, because that didn't happen, the game didn't succeed in China either. Um, frequent updates are essential. These have got to be planned right up front, and they've got to be regular. Don't just go into this world of thinking we'll do updates now. They have to be planned, they have to be regular. Sorry, I'm rushing. And be generous. Hey, guess what? I'm telling you to make the game free to give it away. I'm telling you to let people have your game in other territories, and they'll take a revenue share, and now I'm telling you to give stuff away as well. It works. Supercell, the most generous game in the world, is the game that takes two and a half million, uh, sorry, Clash of Clans, is the most generous game in the world, and yet it's, it generates two and a half million dollars per day in revenue for Supercell. It's $969 million a year for that game, that game uh, generates. Don't change your business model. By all means, if you're paid, do one day where you drop it to free to generate interest and keep it going. You'll be amazed at how well it works. Some people say, catch me afterwards, I'll give you a fine example of why you should drop it to free. Never, ever, 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 ever go from free to paid for two reasons. One, all those people that have downloaded you are going to be mightily pissed off. Um, that, that you, sorry, the people that are waiting to download you are going to be mightily pissed off. Also, your game model doesn't work because you're still charging people for the gems. And another reason for people to get annoyed with you. In-game ads are growing faster. Be subtle with them. Don't do them as banners. In-game ads have grown in revenue a huge, huge amount. The most popular one reward users. So make them watch a video, give them gems or your in-game currency for doing so. And ignore Apple TV. Because I've seen, I know what's coming on Apple TV. They're console quality games that are going to sell for 15 quid and you won't be able to compete within the next six months 
next year, next 18 months. Let the market become multi-structured in terms of payment. But for the moment, if you're making a game for iOS and you're making a game for Android, don't just think you're going to port it to Apple TV and enjoy any success because you won't. Finally, uh, yeah, I think this is finally. Um, community, because this is, this is massively important as well. Community, start straight away. As soon as you have your idea, as soon as you start your Kickstarter, as soon as you go to investors, you should be building your community. This is, the, this is vital. Share everything about your product. I'll say you share everything about your product in due course. The secret stuff, keep. The revolutionary stuff, keep until you're closer to release. Apple don't let you promote your game in advance of launch. They let you do press release, etc. Et they do. They're really restrictive on it. They can't stop you building a community, and you really need to start because, um, because I'm going to tell you in a second what not to do in marketing. Use every channel available. So not just Twitter and not just Facebook. Use Quora as well. Why, why shouldn't you be set up on Quora and encouraging your community to ask questions about your game? It reaches more people. When you get closer to, to um, when you get closer to release, use App Picker, pre app Use everything you possibly have. But bear in mind these platforms exist for different reasons. Don't just repeat the same message on each of them because your community are very, very bored and switch off very, very quickly. Influencers and evangelizers, these are not the people with the most amount of followers, they're the most important people on Twitter. All right? I'm not claiming I'm the most important person on Twitter, but three years ago I was the 9,666th most influential person on Twitter for a period of five days. It was, it was actually for a tweet about the local football club, believe it or not. Um, I didn't last long, but I didn't have many followers. And, uh, yes, it's exactly like Brendan Rogers. Um, but for a short period of time, I was an influencer and ambassador. Justin Bieber had 2.6 million, but he wouldn't have been as important in that particular case. What I'm saying is find out who your influencer and evangelizer are. They're the people who, who really have influence. Positive word of mouth. There's a, there's a research, there are two research papers published this year, one by Forrester, one by Nielsen, which looks at the motivations of people to download apps. I'm sorry to speak fast because I've overrun time. Word, word of mouth is vitally important. The reason word of mouth is vitally important is because it generates 15 to 20% of downloads from the app store. Advertising generates 5%. Okay, I'll tell you what generates the most amount of downloads in just a second or two. And bad reviews kill me. Remember when I said I had quite a few that, uh, that have failed miserably? <coughs> this was one of mine. It was a game called Theme Park. And uh, I love this. Uh, Morally bankrupt disgrace, EA a scum, one star. <laughs> we have a community. The reason to have a community is once everybody's excited, once you've been building it for two years, they all go out and download your app. They've been looking forward to it. They're all going to be five stars on the first pages. Hey, who scrolls down beyond the first 20 reviews of anything? Nobody. Get those reviews up. First, first 20 reviews from that, one star, morally bankrupt. We were awful. We made every mistake imaginable, and it killed the game. I would say it wasn't my fault, but it probably was. Um, use push. Um, if it's relevant and engaging, if it's frequent, but it's not spam, people buy into it. Clash of Clans, if you haven't played Clash of Clans, just have a look at it and look at their push notifications. They're brilliant. In fact, have a look at Clash of Clans. Don't get addicted. It is an exceptionally good game. Don't spend money on it either. Seriously, don't spend money on it. So I've seen people actually go, see, out of time. I've got a slide called out of time. It's like, marketing. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. There's, uh, there's four principles of marketing. Earning, own, share, paid. Ignore paid. When you go to investors, you should have a, between 50 and 100% of your budget, uh, sorry, 50 to 100% of your dev budget should be the same for publishing, okay? By all means, reserve money for advertising, but never spend it until you absolutely, absolutely have to. It's expensive. User acquisition price, on average, at the moment, is $1.50. If you want to look at a specific target market, women, age 35, in the US, the cost of acquiring a, a, a female user, age 35, in the US, at the moment, $6. So for every user you acquire, it's going to cost you $6. And it's an extraordinary amount, and it's rising. Don't pay for advertising. Wait, build your community, and then you've got somebody to advertise it to. Don't pay for acquisitions. Testing, uh, conscious of beta tests, when you're looking at different price models and you're looking at different gameplay elements, do A-B testing, but also do conscious of beta tests. A conscious of beta test is when you tick that distribution box for Apple, only tip Canada, or only tip Norway. They're the two most popular places for testing an app. Then withdraw it from sale. Analyze all the time. You have to analyze everything you're doing. Again, there's some smashing tools out there that will help you analyze the performance of your game. Make sure you analyze it. Do a conscious beta test because the first things you will find out are hugely 
uh, influential and, and massively important to you. Withdraw it for sale, make your changes, bring it back on sale again. Never stop data analysis. The data analysis that Clash of Clans do, again, come and find me afterwards. There's some amazing stories about how Clash of Clans and God of War, the two biggest games at the moment, uh, actually analyse exactly what I'm doing. It's scary what they know about me as a person. Test everything and submissions. Ask for advice. With a microscope, look through Apple's submissions test. There's, I'll give you one very, very good example. I have seen, I reckon, six apps be rejected after between one and two weeks from Apple for the use of four words in the copy text. And those four words are also available on Android. <laughs> and, yeah, it's a Martin thing. You always say that, don't you? Always say available on PS4 and Xbox. Not this time. Apple won't let you do it. And people just think, oh, yeah, also available on Android. Two weeks later, rejected. It's just cost you two weeks on your on your launch. And you may have uh, stuff being uh, being submitted for advertising. It really screws the launch up. So yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. There's tons more I can do. If you want to come to E4F, if you want to catch me at networking afterwards, feel free to do so. Happy to talk through anything with anybody. So apologies I overran. I didn't touch on half of what I wanted to talk about. I'm really, really sorry. So thank you. Um, James, um, do you want to uh, Yeah, just what I've, I've got to run off, so I wanted to ask you now. Um, on the, you, you said go to the PC, get on PC, so if you, a user can upgrade on PC, Apple don't take their cut, happy days, you get that extra 30%. But my understanding is in terms of VAT, Apple actually take care of your VAT responsibility for international purchases and domestic. So yes. it's actually you're saving ten percent, not thirty that, percent. That, that's fair enough. That's absolutely because fair enough. you take yeah. on that, that liability that Apple Yeah, no, that's Apple, absolutely fair enough. That, is that your understanding of yeah, that, that, that's I'm, I'm, you're the expert and I am kind of No no no, no. actually I think Apple take twenty percent off and then they're thirty percent. I'm not sure the VAT comes within it anymore. I'm um, not sure. I need, to check, I need to check on that. Well, we, I've been up in the app store. We have some limited upgrades. Not on uh, the league that you, you've been experiencing. And it appears to be 30%, but now, now I'm going to go double check it. So will I. And if you want to grab my the, uh, you can see my Twitter thing. Just yeah, get in touch and I'll yeah. check it as well. Oh, I'm at E4F, so. Oh, okay. So well, you can see me down here. Okay, cheers. But also, 10% is 10%. It's 10% that I have and give to Apple. And if you're running at millions, it's less <laughs> money. $800 billion company, they can screw their 10% from me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, so, we've got one more, and then I know the pizza's here, so we'll get so going. Um, have you got one more? I have one more. Yeah. Um, Michelle, am I going? I didn't see um, the hand up first. Grab a hat. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm trying to do that. Oh, um, you said a lot of information, and a lot of it was right, and not saying anything was wrong, but it was a lot to take in at any one point. So, um, importantly, when you're focusing on development and building the actual community, where do you start in terms of going for people in your market? Because it's you constantly get attacked by other people you want to sell their games as well. Well, you are. The, 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 I, I've had a lot of people, uh, I work with a lot of devs, and they're actually paranoid about telling people about the game because they think they're going to get copied. And um, um, the, the reassurance you try to give them is, oh, well, you lived with this game for two years inside your head, so you've refined it, you've got, you've got it worked out absolutely beautifully. And you're already two years of, well, 18 months or whatever ahead of people, and you're starting to make it. You don't have to tell them everything about it. Just start teasing them and then building that picture. And people who are inclined to have the operational setup to copy your app or your game, they're already occupied with kind of what they're doing already. So for them to switch and play catch up with you is, 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 is rather wrong. You see, where do you look for those communities? I think you really, you, I, it's so difficult because I don't know what you're making. If it's a game that's uh, that's you know a zombie game, or if it's a, an app that's a weather forecasting app, or whatever, I, I couldn't. Uh, happy if you want to talk to me about what you're doing, I'm happy to to guide you in that respect. I mean, first off, you've got to look at Facebook groups and, and what's relevant to you. So other people's Facebook groups and, and, and look at what they're doing. I'd say the same with I'd say the same with Twitter. They're, they're, they're obvious channels, but you, you've got to start somewhere. And also about that kind of earned and owned audience is your website. 
Let me, why not set it up straight away? You can teach people with it, you don't have to give everything on it, but have blogs, have dev blogs on there. It's so, it's so important. And have all the communication about where people can access and interact with you in terms of social networks. And it is difficult to find audiences, but you start early enough, you'll be amazed. You will have tons of people who will be interested in your game if, if your app is interesting. You'll have tons of them following you by launch. And at that point, you've got people you can promote your game to. And as that grows, you can then spend money on advertising because you're reminding them to do it. In fact, the God of War, if you catch me after the two, the God of War thing, God of War spends money advertising to people who already play their games. Yeah. They're not interested in, well, they are interested in you consumers, they're more interested in 